Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is the first of the Green Solutions uh, program through the Wayne Public Library and the Wayne Environmental Commission. Um, we are going to be addressing how to improve stormwater runoff um, today with Amy Rowe. And I'm very excited to uh, be able to address this. We've had quite a great response uh, from many people and um, I'll be handing this off shortly to, to Katie McEwen from the Wayne Environmental Commission. We will be having a Q&A at the end of, of the program. Uh, please submit your questions via chat. Uh, we can uh, address anything that's more generalized. Specific questions can be addressed directly to uh, Amy Rowe or Katie McEwen, and we'll have their contact information available at the end. So I'm going to introduce Katie McEwen, who is a Wayne Township resident with her family since 2007. She currently serves on the Wayne Environmental Commission and is in the process of getting her Master Gardener certification through Rutgers Extension. She enjoys any opportunity to help educate her family and our community about our natural environment. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, um, especially to not only to Patty Slezak, but to the Wayne Public Library for supporting programs like this. We feel it's very important um, for public outreach and education to have this available, especially now that we have these technology options. It's a wonderful thing. Um, the project I'm going to be discussing today, um, I just want to say some special thanks to Tim Ropeman, Ryan Edge, and the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, to Richard Stomber and the, my other commissioners on the Wayne Environmental Commission um, for their support of the project. Um, to Cecilia Diaz from Rutgers Cooperative Extension, um, the Passaic County Station here on Route 23. Um, the Association for New Jersey Environmental Commissioners and Elizabeth Ritter for their support and their grant funding for this project was crucial. Um, Kathy Pariser, a huge thanks because none of this would have happened without Kathy. Um, she's a master gardener. Yay, Kathy. Master guard, Wayne, Wayne resident, master gardener, and I will give her the title Extraordinary Citizen. Um, thank you for all your hard work on this. And of course, last but not least, goes to my introduction to Amy Rowe. Um, who's um, a faculty at uh, Rutgers, New Jersey um, Agricultural Experiment Station Cooperative Extension for Essex and Passaic Counties, and our expert for today. Thank you so much for your time and attention to these issues, Amy. We're, your expertise is indispensable to us in Wayne, and we thank you. Thank you, Katie and Patty. Thank you for having me. Thanks to everybody joining. So we will be talking about the, the project that Katie reference, but I'm going to, to save that for the end. So something to look forward to. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about stormwater. We're going to talk about all of the green infrastructure practices that can help us manage stormwater. So let me pull up my PowerPoint. Yeah, so, so we're going to talk about improving stormwater runoff, how we can use natural processes and systems to improve water quality of stormwater as well as managing stormwater water quantity and to reduce localized flooding. So let's just dive right in here. So the first thing we're going to do is define stormwater runoff. This is a phrase that probably you've heard of, um, but sometimes people aren't quite sure of what it is. So basically stormwater is the water that is produced during any precipitation event. So rain, snow, any of those things are, are generating stormwater. Uh, snow melting is considered stormwater also, but then runoff is the water that is coming off of any hard surface. So a driveway, a parking lot, a very compacted athletic field like you see in this picture, uh, rooftops, um, you know, anything that doesn't allow water to flow through it is generating stormwater runoff during a precipitation event. And so we refer to those hard surfaces as impervious cover, impervious surface. You may hear that when talking about stormwater. And so just needed to, to provide some definition. And like I said, the natural fields and turf that we have can also become impervious and generate stormwater runoff also. So it's not just our, our asphalt, it's, it's also our highly compacted 
ball fields and all of those places that people like to walk where the, the ground is so hard and compacted that, that no water gets down into the soil. So just needed to have a definition there before we get any further. Uh, but one of the problems with our stormwater runoff is that it is a huge source of pollution. Um, it is considered non-point source pollution. Now you guys may be familiar with this term, you may not, uh, but basically non-point source pollution is all of the contamination that is picked up by all that stormwater on its way to the receiving water body or down into the into the storm drain. And so all of the, the solids, the nutrients, the organics, the oils, all of those things are collected on a rainy day by all of that stormwater. And so that type of pollution is non-point source pollution because there's no single person that is generating that pollution. It is society pollution, it's all of us, it's just how things happen in our, in our uh, community these days. And this type of pollution is different from point source pollution where you have someone dumping oil into the river or here we have a factory that is, that is discharging directly into a waterway. So you know exactly where that point source came from, but our non-point source pollution is much more difficult to control. It's much more difficult to, to figure out how to, how to manage that pollution. And so just be aware that we are dealing with a very complicated topic. And so, so here's some examples. I just went through some of them, um, but all of this stuff is collected by stormwater on its way to, to our rivers and streams, on its way to, to our stormwater basins, on its way to the water treatment plant, wherever it's ending up. Um, so even our, all of our geese, look at those, those Canadian geese there. I'm sure you guys know that they are generating uh, poop and in that poop is bacteria, fecal coliform, uh, all the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that are leading to polluted lakes and streams. And a single goose can poop one pound of poop per day. So think about all of the, all of the geese that you encounter in, in all the parks and all of our, our nice recreational areas. And so just keep that in mind that it's not just people that are polluting, but also animals. Uh, so make sure you pick up after your pets as well out in the, out in the yard and out in, on the sidewalks because uh, they, can, they can have contamination also into our, into our stormwater waterways. Um, so oil and grease, fertilizer, trash and debris, all those water bottles, all of these things are ending up in our, in our waterways and in our, our rivers and streams. Every, every place that we get our drinking water from up in North Jersey, uh, the majority of our drinking water comes from surface water. So all of our beautiful reservoirs up in the northern part of Passaic County. So we need to keep them, we need to keep them clean. We need to make sure that we're keeping our, our stormwater relatively uncontaminated. And so that's why we are here talking about this today. So why do we care about this? Well, obviously water quality is important. It's not just for our, our drinking water, but our fish and wildlife are impacted by contamination. Our recreational water activities, you don't wanna drive your, your boat through this, this algae patch through here, even that heron doesn't wanna be fishing through there. Uh, and this can also impact fishing, commercial fishing, tourism. And obviously our, our drinking water is the number one thing we're trying to protect here. So we need to, we need to be aware of how, how we are impacting not just our local community, but also the larger ecosystems that are in place. Okay, so, so we talked about impervious surfaces and all of that impervious cover, but another problem with the way that we manage stormwater right now is that all of our impervious surfaces are connected. So there's no chance for groundwater recharge of that stormwater or for the plants to uptake that water because you have your, you have your rooftop where it's raining, you have your gutter, your downspout. It's this downspout you can see on the left, it's right on the driveway. So it is coming across a hard surface. It is going down into the, into the storm drain. It is coming out into the, into the retention basin. 
And so there's, there's nothing natural about this process. We don't have any way of just letting biological processes take place and having that water be back in the, in the, the original hydrology and the, the correct process um, for, for how to deal with water. How nature deals with water is completely eliminated from the system. We just have hard surface after hard surface, which also is leading to erosion uh, of our rivers and streams because we have so much stormwater coming through the system down into, into our water bodies that the, the rivers and streams are overwhelmed. They literally cannot handle both the quantity and the speed of all of the water that's coming through there. And so because of that, we have erosion. I'm sure you've seen along a stream bank where the tree roots are just hanging out. It looks like the tree is just gonna fall over. And that's because, because of stormwater. We have too much volume coming through at a speed that's too quick for the, for the rivers and streams to handle. So we need to, we need to disrupt this. We need to completely change how we're thinking about stormwater. Usually stormwater is considered out of sight, out of mind, where people just want the water away from their, their houses and properties as much as possible. Um, but because of that, we are having all of these issues. And if you live in Wayne, I'm sure you've noticed that you have very, very, um, recurring flooding and localized flooding in your in your neighborhoods, maybe into your house. Um, roadways are often uh, flooded out. I know Route 23 is always being diverted and closed because of flooding issues during large storm events. And so we, we need to disconnect all of these hard surfaces. So one of the ways to do this is called green infrastructure. So this is where we are using nature and using natural conditions to approach stormwater in, in a more uh, ecologically friendly and sustainable way. And so here's an example. You have a parking lot that in the parking islands has special plants that are chosen specifically to, to manage these conditions. And you can see this little curb cut right here that's allowing the water to flow into, into that parking island. So basically you are using grasses and trees and shrubs and nature to manage stormwater in a parking lot rather than a giant detention basin. You know, we've all seen them at the, at the big box stores where you just have, you know, an entire acre of concrete uh, holding water um, so that the, the stream system doesn't become overwhelmed. But in this system, we are using soil, we are using plants to manage that stormwater in a much more effective way. So this is an example of green infrastructure where we're getting back to the natural way of managing water. And this approach to stormwater management is all about small scale changes that can be grouped together to form a larger scale, bigger picture stormwater management tool. And so this is often a retrofit to existing infrastructure, or it can be a, a brand new installation depending on what you're putting in. But the, the heart of green infrastructure is all about using nature, using plants, trying to get back to the hydrology that existed at that, at that site before all of us humans got here and needed all of our driveways and parking lots and all of our, our hard surfaces. So we are just trying to, to use ecologically friendly approaches to managing stormwater. So there are two different scales of approaching stormwater. So we have the site level, and then we have the neighborhood or the, the larger scale uh, version of, of basically the same techniques. And so at the site level, there are green roofs, there's rainwater harvesting, rain garden, we'll talk about in a little bit, permeable pavement, swales, detention basins that have been naturalized, meaning that they are allowing plants and grasses to be uptaking that water and to, to slow down the flow. And then on the neighborhood side, you you have much, 
much bigger picture approaches where you are installing things at the whole community level rather than just a single property. And so we're, we're not really gonna talk about the, the neighborhood or large scales. We want to provide you residents of Wayne with some ideas for what you can do on your own property, as well as what we can do at the smaller scale neighborhood level. So we won't, we won't really be talking about these, these larger scale things today. Okay, so before we get into the different techniques, I just want to, to go over the benefits of green infrastructure. So it's not just, it's not just about necessarily the natural conditions and having all of our um, all of our ecosystems back in balance, but there are all kinds of things that these types of practices can provide compared to what we call gray infrastructure, which is the concrete, all of those hard surfaces, all of the pipes and tunnels, uh, all of the, the dams and levees that are installed. So this green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure provides a lot of benefits that you may not think about because you, it's, never been, it's never been managed this way. Uh, so we already talked about groundwater recharge. So basically our, these types of systems are infiltrating water back down to, to the groundwater, providing base flow for our rivers and streams during drier times. Obviously with, with climate change a little bit, I'm sure you've noticed that we are having more and more precipitation events. They are more extreme than they used to be. Uh, we have many, many weeks where it rains two or three or four days in a row. Um, and so we are, it's not your imagination, we are receiving more precipitation than we used to. Um, and like I said, those events are becoming more extreme. And so we need to, to use these types of practices to adapt to climate change as well, uh, which isn't really, it's not really on this slide, but it makes communities more resilient because you are planning using nature rather than an engineered design that is specifically designed for a storm event. Um, and getting that water away as quickly as possible, where here we are trying to, to infiltrate and to try to, to provide ecological benefit of that storm water and not necessarily thinking of it as a nuisance. Um, and so because of that, our green infrastructure can also help reduce localized flooding, flooding and it can manage uh, drainage issues much better than that gray infrastructure. Uh, but another benefit, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you are providing habitat for all kinds of creatures uh, because you are using natural systems. You are installing grasses, you're installing perennials, you're installing trees. And so these types of installations provide habitat for insects, birds, pollinators, so bees, butterflies, uh, all these kinds of, of creatures that with our gray infrastructure, they wouldn't have any habitat there. Uh, for our rain gardens and for our vegetated swales, we are recommending native plants, uh, which are important to our local ecosystems because those creatures are already adapted to our climate, to our pests and diseases, and to our, to our uh, are conditions that we already have here. And so native plants being used in these types of installations can really, really improve wildlife habitat. And it's not just the flowers and not just pollinating, but also those, uh, those plants can provide uh, food for birds. It can provide nesting habitat if you leave the, the grasses over the winter so that the animals have a place to live. Um, and so we're really, we're really doing multiple, multiple benefits in the ecosystem and not just, not just the plants themselves, but they are, are providing food and shelter for, for a lot of our, our critters as well. Uh, so another benefit of green infrastructure is that the maintenance costs are relatively low compared to, <clears throat> compared to our gray infrastructure. And so basically, you are adding another landscaping maintenance rather than 
the, the heavy duty maintenance that is involved in all of our, our concrete and piping um, infrastructure. So rather than having to, to clean out the, the inlet of, of a huge detention basin of making sure the overflow is, is not clogged, of checking on the, you know, the concrete situation, making sure that things are, are still working. Whereas with a rain garden, you're just weeding, you may be mowing, um, you are, are doing maintenance that is, is a lot more low cost overall. Um, and these types of systems tend to last much longer because they are natural. They require even less maintenance as they start to really establish themselves. Once you get a rain garden going, uh, it kind of goes on its own once the plants are established. And so uh, the maintenance costs are greatly reduced, although they are different. And so the pots of money for that, I know Katie with the town is probably wondering how she's going to sell this to, to some of the, the administration, but um, but yeah, we can we can talk about that later. But but overall, maintenance costs are greatly reduced with a more natural system compared to all that that gray concrete. Um, so obviously, using natural systems provides aesthetic benefits. Uh, it's much better to look at a beautiful rain garden with our with our native perennials versus a a giant boring gray concrete retention basin. Um, so yeah, you're, you're looking at something that is aesthetically pleasing as well as managing stormwater. Um, and so that, that combination really adds to, adds to the, the beauty of a neighborhood or the beauty of the municipal building rather than, than having another curb and cut, curb and gutter system and, and those kinds of things. So that's, that's something that's important for sure, especially when you're, when you're trying to make the case for it um, for, with administration. Uh, and then another great thing about green infrastructure is that you are minimizing site disturbance. So instead of having a giant backhoe and bulldozer come to install a detention basin, a series of rain gardens can be done with much smaller equipment. It is a much smaller footprint in terms of everyone that's at the site, the crew that's needed. These are really fairly easy to install systems. And so the, the site disturbances are much less compared to gray infrastructure. Uh, so another one that, that is actually something that people might not think about is that our, our green infrastructure practices can actually help reduce the urban heat island effects. So if you're not familiar with that concept, uh, in, our, in our more urban areas where we have so much impervious cover and all that asphalt and all of those hard surfaces, the, the sun comes into the city and into that developed area and all of the sun's heat gets soaked up by the, by the asphalt, by the rooftops, by those dark materials. And then the, as the day goes on and the, um, the sun goes away, but in the, in the nighttime, the heat that was absorbed by all that asphalt is brought back into the city. And so that's why cities are so much warmer uh, than out in a rural area that has lots of lots of grass and trees because all of those hard surfaces are just soaking up and holding on to heat until the nighttime when it is it is coming out and everyone is just sweltering even though it's it's nighttime the sun's not even there and so with our with our green infrastructure practices you don't have the the absorption of all of that heat those plants are actually helping cool our localized environment compared to compared to all that asphalt, all that concrete. And so the mitigation of the urban heat island effect is just an added bonus of our of our green infrastructure that people might not be aware of. Um, I know this list is a lot, but I want to talk through each of them. So thanks for the patience. Uh, so finally, contaminant removal is a huge benefit of green infrastructure. So basically the soil that all of our plants for all of our green infrastructure practices, what, what they are planted in, it, it, the whole system is acting like a filter. And so the, 
the water comes in and as it moves through the different layers of our, of our rain garden or our vegetated swale, uh, we're actually getting pollutant removals. Uh, so these types of systems can remove solids, they can remove nutrients, they can remove organics, uh, they can break down some pathogens depending on, on what kinds of plants you have in there. And so you may not think of, of plants or rain gardens as, as doing much work, but they are helping remove pollutants from our stormwater from our stormwater that is highly contaminated as we already discussed. And so really these types of practices are, are doing multiple jobs. So these are all the things that they're doing compared to our traditional gray infrastructure. So why don't we just get into green infrastructure practices? Are there any questions that are completely burning that we need to answer before I move on? We're good. Amy, I just wanted to add, besides that whole wonderful list of benefits, um, also lately, uh, in recent history, we've had supply chain issues. And native plants uh, and a lot of gravel, actually, and rock are kind of immune to those supply chain issues, where if you get into asphalt, concrete, more traditional um, sol solutions to try and deal with water as a nuisance instead of a resource, those things are getting more and more expensive exponentially. So that's an additional benefit, I think. Sure, that, that is a great point. I hadn't really thought about that just because these supply chain issues are relatively recent. Um, yeah. But yeah, that is, that is a, a great addition to this list because like you said, getting, getting in infrastructure types of of supplies, like not just the, the piping, the sewer grates, the, the amount of concrete and yeah. you know, all of those, those types of materials, they need, to be, they need to be mined. They come from a quarry. They are coming from faraway places. Yeah. Um, and so it's not just the supply itself, but our transportation system is, is having issues right now as well. So that's a, that's a great point versus plants and um, soil and um, you know those kinds of things are relatively local compared to compared to these large scale gray infrastructure installations. So thank you. Thank you for adding that for sure. Definitely. There's far less externalities, the simpler the solution. So if you're trying to get concrete, which is awful for the environment to begin with, to even to process it, even the fuel to process the concrete, you know, which is wildly expensive right now, and then ship that from, for example, India is the number one producer of concrete, to send that all the way here just to try and deal with something you could use native plants for. I mean, yeah, that's a great example. So thank you. Thank you for, for that addition. I will definitely add that to this slide uh, after this talk. I appreciate the, the info. Um, so, so now we're going to get into green infrastructure practices, and obviously not all of these are things that you're going to do at home, but we're, we're going to go in increasing, increasing order. Uh, so we'll start with things that you can do at home. So if you can't do anything else for stormwater management at your property or in your neighborhood, one thing that you can do that is so simple is just to redirect or disconnect your downspout. So instead of having your downspout discharge onto your driveway, have it go into the lawn, have it go into a garden, have it go into turf, have it go into anything that will allow that water to be soaked in and infiltrate down into the ground rather than being connected to all those hard surfaces that we talked about. So look at this picture in the bottom right. We are just moving the downspout maybe six inches just off the driveway onto that little splash pad so that you don't get a gully in your, in your lawn. Um, just just move it six inches, get it off of that driveway so that that water has a chance to infiltrate. This is, this is the easiest thing you could do. If you don't do anything, if you don't take anything away from this presentation, just move your downspout 
off of that driveway, off of that hard surface, get it to something that can soak it up. And there are some people that have a downspout that is going down into their turf, across the lawn, underneath, and then directly to, to the roadway. And so some people say, well, how do I disconnect from this? Well, this is even this is even more important because you really don't have a chance for infiltration here. So you're gonna have to cut that downspout and put, put something at the bottom. Um, so it could just be an elbow out into your yard. It could be one of these, um, you know, accordion, they call them flexible, uh, flexible downspout connector. I don't even know, but it, it comes in a, it's actually all, squish together and then you can pull it out and direct it wherever you want it. Just put something, so cut this downspout. We don't want that water going directly to the road. Get it out into your lawn, get it into your garden. But even better, if you disconnect your downspout, one thing that you can do is rainwater harvesting. Connect that downspout to a rain barrel. Connect it to a cistern, which is just a large tank that's for that's for collecting rainwater. Um, this is an even better solution because you are capturing that rainwater to use it for a beneficial use. Um, so, so this system on the right here, this is a school system down in South Jersey. They're collecting rainwater from their roof to flush the toilets in the school. They're using all of that nuisance rainwater and stormwater for something useful. Why are we using drinking water quality water to flush our toilets? We don't need to. We could use captured rainwater to do that. And so this system obviously doesn't operate in the winter because we would have giant ice blocks in our system. And so that's why on the on the downspouts, you can see there's there's some connections, there's some little um, diverters here. And so they just switch the diverter so that the, the system does connect to the regular infrastructure during the winter months. Because believe me, rainwater harvesting doesn't work so well uh, when everything's frozen. So please keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, if you do connect your downspout to a rainwater harvesting system, you have to disconnect it in the winter or else you will break every tank that you have if the water freezes in there when you have a full tank. Ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> we did that by accident on our farm. We just wanted to see what would happen. And yes, it froze and it broke our rain barrel. Um, so yeah, just think of all the possibilities of what you could do instead of this collecting rainwater that's been harvested. So this is, this is considered a green infrastructure practice because we are collecting that water, we are using it for gardening. You could use it to water your lawn, you could use it to wa wash your car, wash your muddy boots, wash your dog before they come in all muddy. Um, there are a million ways that you can use rain, rainwater that's harvested from your rooftop. Um, now, unfortunately, a regular size rain barrel on the left here is usually about 50 to 55 gallons. So this is, relatively small. If we get an inch of rain on an 800 square foot roof, you are generating 400 gallons of water. So you're not gonna be able to capture all the water that's coming off of your roof, but every little bit helps and you can reuse that water for, for something beneficial. Um, so yeah, definitely consider rainwater harvesting. I'm sure lots of you probably already have a rain barrel. We water, I have a small farm, we water all of our animals. So chickens, turkeys, everybody gets water from the rooftop of their, of their coop. Uh, we don't have irrigation out in the, in the field. Everybody's getting rainwater and it's, it's a great way. It's a great resource. Why are we throwing it right down the drain? Um, so rainwater harvesting is something very simple that you could do to not only manage stormwater quantity, because we are your capturing and reusing water, but this is also helping with stormwater water quality because you are capturing stormwater before it even becomes stormwater, before it even leaves your property and starts to collect contaminants, you are 
reserving that, you are saving it for later. It doesn't have contaminants yet. And so you are doing double duty with rainwater harvesting. Amy? Oh, yes. Sorry. Can I just ask, sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a question specific to this slide from another Wayne Environmental Commissioner, Vula Papadopoulos. She's watching right now. Hello. Okay. And she's asking about the terracotta um, rain receptacle. Um, can you kind of name it for us? Describe what's happening there. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. I don't know what the name is. It may be called something like rainwater planter or something like that. So basically the, the downspout comes down into the planter area and you have a, a small tray of plants that sits on top of it. And so the, the roots of the plants can go down into, into the reservoir. And so that's how they're, that's how they're existing. Um, so this type, so it, it looks terracotta, but it's actually plastic, um, oh, it okay. is very expensive compared to, um, you know, a 50 gallon rain barrel, but it looks a lot nicer. And the aesthetic is something that's important to, to a lot of homeowners. So, so take a look. I can, I can send you some, some other oh. examples if, if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a dual system where the, the plants are sitting right on top of the collected water and so their roots grow down into it and yeah it's it's an ingenious um, invention, I guess, uh, you know, a different take on the on the plain old rain barrel. Um, but yeah, it, it's really nice and unfortunately it, it's very expensive compared to you know, usually the the rain barrels at, at a big box store are anywhere between like seventy five to one hundred dollars, and this one is is over two hundred. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's more than double, but but it looks great, and you can you can grow plants right on it. So that's pretty so, yeah. Good. Gardner uh, Rebecca Walters is telling us that Gardener Supply calls it an urn. An urn. Yes, a okay. rainwater collection urn. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, that implies all kinds of things, but um, yeah, we um, yeah, Thank there are, there are all kinds of of things on the market, and you can find anything. People are really clever, so so yeah, that one's cool. Any other questions or comments? How are we doing on time? I don't know we're doing all right. We'll we'll get through this. We we did the hard part. We did the the technical stuff. Now we're we're just getting into the different practices. Okay, so now we can talk about rain gardens, which is the project that we'll be discussing towards the end of this talk. Um, so rain, a rain garden is merely a shallow landscape depression that is used to, to manage stormwater. So it's, think of it as a bowl that is installed in, in the property to, to capture stormwater. This is not a pool, it's not a pond, it doesn't have standing water in it. Water needs to infiltrate through there after a rain event between 24 to 48 hours. We don't want this to be a hazard. We don't want it to be breeding mosquitoes. This is dry most of the time. We are not putting wetland plants in here. Again, this is, this is a dry installation except 24 hours after a rainstorm. But it's called a rain garden because that's basically what it is doing. It is a garden that grows with the rain and from the stormwater that is coming through there. So there are plants that need to be chosen specifically for those both wet and dry conditions. And we could do a whole workshop just on rain garden plants. Um, but for now, let me just introduce the concept to you. So here we have the different parts of a rain garden. So the base, is the workhorse of your rain garden. This is where the infiltration is happening. So that base needs to be completely flat. It needs to be level. We don't want any preferential flow paths through there. Um, and that water is infiltrating through within 24 to 48 hours. I'm gonna say that multiple times because this is, this is not standing water. We are not creating hazards here. So then on the upper part of the base, we have the slope. So this is the transition zone between the two parts. So the buffer 
is the dry part that's on the outside. And so different plants go in the different places. And you can see here, I don't, actually, I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can read it. Typical depth of the rain garden, three to eight inches, inches. This is not deep. This is a shallow depression that is doing some stormwater management capture for you. And so this is why the rain garden has to be a specific surface area in order to manage whatever is coming off of your impervious surface. So a lot of rain gardens collect water from a rooftop. Some of them collect from a roadway or a driveway. And so whatever we're collecting, that's how we're going to determine the size of the rain garden because your rain garden has to be able to handle the stormwater that's coming into it. And so there are all kinds of ways to, to do those design calculations. So we're not gonna get into that here, um, but this is a slightly engineered system. You need, you need to do some calculations, but anyone can install this. Um, you can see these pictures on the right. We have my, my smallest rain garden I've ever installed in Newark. It was seven by 10, 70 square feet it is a teeny tiny little rain garden. I call it my pocket rain garden. And then in Maplewood, we did a huge rain garden at the Hilton Branch Library. It is 2000 square feet um, because it's taking water from the parking lot as well as the library of the building there. And so because it was taking on so much water, the rain garden itself has to be a huge size in order to infiltrate that quickly. So just wanted to give you the, the two extremes that I have there. And so, so let's look at another property. So this is, this is a famous case study of a rain garden in Maplewood, Minnesota. So I was showing you Maplewood, New Jersey. This is Maplewood, Minnesota, where they did a, a rain garden installation in an entire neighborhood as part of a research study. And you can see, look how much better this property looks with this rain garden installed. So instead of coming off of the rooftop, the water's coming in through this curb cut um, and through this, this little sidewalk um, you know, depression so that the water flows into there. And so you're not just adding aesthetics, but this is improving property value. This is so much better than just turf. Um, and it's, it's providing that, that stormwater management benefit. It's providing habitat. I just needed you to see how beautiful a rain garden can be with, with native plants and with just a little bit of design panache. You can see there's a little bit of a retaining wall on the back end. Um, so the, the possibilities are endless. This doesn't have to look like you know, a mess. Some people think of native plant installations as looking too weedy or too wild. But if you design things well, and if you install plants and keep, keep, keep up with the maintenance, uh, it can really look aesthetically pleasing. So there's your rain gardens. We will come back to this uh, at the end of the program because we're going to talk about Kathy's amazing rain garden project. Um, but let's just keep going for a second. So, so now we're on to the green infrastructure practices that you will not be installing on your own. Uh, these are heavily engineered systems. This is a green roof. Um, on the left is the city of Chicago, their green roof on their um, municipal building, their, their city hall is nearly a city block. It is huge. Uh, but for more close to home, this is the Essex County Environmental Center on the right hand side. They have a green roof installed on top of their building. And so green roofs are specifically designed to hold stormwater. The media that the plants are planted in is actually, it's not soil, it's a very light uh, engineered gravel-like substance uh, that is extraordinary at soaking up water. So we're not putting heavy topsoil or compost up on this green roof. It needs to be very light um, because the, the water itself is going to be so much weight that the plants and the, the soil, the media that they're going into has to be a very, very light 
material. And so usually on green roofs, you are installing what are called sedums or desert plants um, because your green roof is just gonna bake in the sun. You're not gonna be able to grow uh, you know, trees or shrubs or anything like that. These are, these are plants that are similar to cacti in terms of their, their root systems. They have very shallow roots and they are they're desert plants basically because it's basically a desert on top of on top of a roof where the sun is just beating down on it every day and then all of those plants and all of that media just soaks up water when it rains and so it's these are really cool installations why wouldn't you try to do stormwater management on a rooftop uh, it's a lot of of property that's just sitting there doing nothing uh, and so these systems they have they have an inflow, they have an overflow in case they get, you know, Hurricane Sandy coming through, they need to be able to manage 12 inches of rain in 24 hours. And so they are designed for, for large storm events uh, with that overflow. So yeah, green roofs are advanced technique. Don't try this at home. Um, so another technique that is fairly advanced, you would definitely require an engineer to install is called permeable pavement. So this is a pavement type that allows water to infiltrate through it. And there are, there are several different approaches to this. So on the, the top of these pictures, you have, you have interlocking concrete pavers with gravel in between. You have porous concrete, you have porous asphalt, and then you have you have what they call these, they call these turf pavers or grass pavers, where they're just large blocks that connect together, but they allow grass to grow through them. Uh, the grassy paver is used a lot for overflow parking or for, for access to, to places and parks. Uh, like if the facilities guys need to get in somewhere, they use these grassy, grassy pavers a lot. But permeable pavement is great. It can infiltrate thousands of inches of rain per hour. I mean, this system, is allowing basically any kind of storm that we would get to flow through there. And with the, with the um, manufactured materials like asphalt and concrete, what they do is they remove the fine particles from the, from the manufacturing mix. So at the plant, they just have a removal of the teeny tiny little grit particles so that when the concrete or the asphalt is poured, it is poured in place but it leaves these, these pores behind so that water can flow through. So it's not the solid, um, solid system that our traditional asphalt or concrete is. And so you can see in this picture on the bottom, this is a rain event at the, at the EPA in Edison. We had a, a research facility there. You can see how wet the traditional asphalt is on the left. And on the right is porous asphalt. So it looks dry. It looks like you could drive on there with no puddles, no anything. And so these types of systems are amazing stormwater management tools, but they require a lot of investment up front. They require a lot of engineering. Like I said, this is not something you're, you're going to do at home, but I'm going to to show you how this is a whole storage system for stormwater. It's not just the surface itself that's permeable. Then you have a whole layer of gravel or stone underneath, and then you get down to the existing soil. And so, so it's not just the surface itself, it's a whole storage system underneath there. So I'm going to show you this video. Hopefully it will play. Can you guys see the video? So this is pervious concrete. It is raining, and then this concrete truck is bringing 2,000 gallons of water. 2,000 gallons of water infiltrated in three minutes. Okay, doing good. So I just wanted you to see how well these types of systems can infiltrate water. That's amazing. Okay, get the idea. <laughs> I know we're, we're running out of time here. Um, so because of the huge stormwater storage that's underneath those, those permeable pavements, you can, you can manage 
acres of impervious cover. Um, and so this type of system is installed in, in parking lots. Um, and it can also be used for, for pedestrian use, like sidewalks, driveways. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a large investment upfront. It is very costly. Um, but there are, there are manufacturers in New Jersey that do produce it. So if you have any questions, come talk to me because this is, this is my, my area of expertise. We could do three hours just on permeable pavement, but we won't, we won't bore you with that. Um, so our next green infrastructure practice is vegetated swales, which are similar to rain gardens, except they are much larger. They are very long. So basically a swale is just a ditch. It's what you see along a highway so that you're not driving into the forest. Uh, it's, a, it's a safety installation as well as providing that stormwater management tool. Uh, so the vegetation that you're choosing, so grasses, you can use native, native perennials, it doesn't have to be grass. These types of systems are used along, along transportation gateways. So this is for highways, roads, um, it, this can be used at the residential level, but it is it would be smaller scale. Um, so when we're talking about a swell, we're usually talking about something much more, um, much more, I guess, bigger in every way, longer, you know, it's much bigger than a rain garden because it is, it is, um, not just, not just one spot. It is mild. It could be miles of vegetated swell. Um, and the, the uptake of pollutants is also very efficient in here because like I said, this is acting just like a rain garden. It's just much narrower and much longer. So usually we'll see this along a highway or a roadway system. And we have our natural detention basin. So instead of concrete and all of that gray infrastructure, you can have the same kind of basin you know, the same dimensions, but instead of all that concrete, you put plants in it, you put trees in it, you allow animals to be in there. You don't need to mow it. Uh, you just let it do its natural thing. Uh, and so this allows water to be infiltrating, to be uptaken by all of those, all of those plants. And look how much better it looks. Doesn't this look better than a giant concrete pit I think so. Uh, so yeah, so this is our, our, um, our, veg our naturalized detention basin. And then I just wanted to show you some larger scale things. So green parking is often using permeable pavement. Um, and this is, again, a much larger scale system. This could be a whole mall parking lot. This could be, this could be, you know, something larger scale. This is not just my driveway, not just your driveway. This is, this is a, a large scale site-based installation. So this is heavily engineered. You are managing stormwater for the entire site with this type of installation. And then we have green streets. Uh, you may have heard the term green streets. It's just using green infrastructure to to manage everything that's in a city. So you've got your sidewalk, you've got the street itself, you have the curb, you have multiple functions happening here. And so those green streets have to be working for, for pedestrians, for bike, bikers, bicyclists. They have to be working for cars, there needs to be parking. And so these types of systems are very adaptable, they're very flexible. And so you can see how beautiful it looks having these green installations and they are managing stormwater without people even knowing it uh, most of the time. So, so this is another approach. This is Philadelphia, uh, these two pictures, but New York City has this type of, of initiative. Um, the West Coast has all kinds of, of similar installations. And so, so yeah, take a look. The next time you're in a city, I'm sure you will see some form of, of a green street because it is... This is the new hot, exciting topic um, in our in our cities. So now, before we go, I know we're getting close to the end. I want to talk about the Winding Way Park project, which is what Katie was talking about at the beginning. Um, 
So Kathy Pariser is the, the lead on a project that was sponsored by ANJEC, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. And at the Winding Way um, neighborhood, they have had flooding forever. Uh, and a lot of houses have been, have been bought out. And this Winding Way Park is the result of a buyout of, I think, I think it was a couple of properties all combined into one. And the, the town is going to be making it a park. They have already installed the gazebo. And so Kathy wanted to make sure that there was going to be stormwater management on the site. And so she proposed installing a rain garden, which would, again, beautify the area provide some localized stormwater management, and as well as all of those good things, provide some education about stormwater in a, a township that obviously has stormwater issues. And so this project is on its way. It's been planned for, for a while now. Kathy has been relentless in uh, pursuing this. And so like Katie said, we've got, we've got the township on board, the environmental commission, the master gardeners are involved. Kathy is doing this as part of her environmental stewards project, which is a, another Rutgers training uh, volunteer program. And so extension is involved. We are very excited for this. And I don't know if Kathy is on here, probably. I don't know if we can, if she has anything to say about this. I don't know if we can add her at this point, but she's been working really hard to get this up and running. And if if you're interested in this project, for sure, please reach out to Kathy. We can give you her info. Mm -hmm. um, but we, the, yeah, yeah, Katie, she's here. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, the master gardeners are working on a design for the plants, and we are hoping to to be right on target to do a planting day in May. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's an exciting project to work on stormwater management in a town that has a lot of flooding issues. Uh, and so we'll be providing education. This um, talk and presentation was, was part of the outreach and education component of the grant funding that was received. And so thank you all for coming and joining us today. I hope you learned something and please don't be shy about joining us with the Winding Way Park project. But I just want to end um, just a couple acknowledgements. My colleague Michelle and the Rutgers Water Resources Program provided some, some of the pictures for this talk. And then here's my contact info. Please don't be shy. I am not going to answer questions this moment about your backyard that has drainage issues, but I would love to talk to you. Please reach out to me. I can do a site visit. We can talk about solutions for, for stormwater on your property. Here's my, my info, my email, and my phone number. So please don't be shy. Just we're not talking about that today. So I'll take some, some questions uh, from the group now. But thank you so much for, for having me and for listening to uh, Stormwater, which is a very, very important and exciting topic for me. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Amy. That was really great. Um, I think there's some wonderful resources in your presentation for our residents and I put my email address, my township email address in the chat if anybody wants to email me um, for any kind of information or if you have specific questions to Wayne, um, feel free to email me. I can share it with the rest of the Environmental Commission or contact any of the resource, wonderful resources that we have at Rutgers. I wanted to add, I forgot to add, um, I'm also taking the green infrastructure program on Fridays oh, with, good. with Chris Abrocha. So he's, he's a great resource. And he said something today that, that resonated with me, which is manage at the source. And when I saw your um, many photos of downspouts, um, really that's, that's, that's cuts to the heart of it. Um, it and there's, there's things that we can all do as residents to manage at the source, which all contributes to the, you know, to, to alleviating a bigger problem. So I encourage my fellow residents in Wayne to get curious and it's supposed to start raining tomorrow about this time. So I encourage you to put on your rain jacket and your rain boots and go walk your property when the rain starts coming down and take a look at where you see 
the rain going um, and take photos if you need to, to remind yourself, you know, what, what kind of projects you might want to implement on your own property. Not only are we prone to flooding and these issues are exacerbated by our flooding issues on a gra greater scale, but um, people are having problems dealing with these one-time rain events um, on their own property. So we want to be a good resource and we want to help um, not only to individual people, but for our community at large. So I'm very encouraged by um, everything that I'm learning from not only from you, but from Chris and, and through the programs, through Rutgers, you guys really have done an amazing job reaching out to the public and educating people. So I credit you immensely for that. Um, I know Kathy wanted me to ask a quick question about silt pollution, about um, what happens when you do construction and um, silt fences and kind of like mitigating silt as an issue. And then I had a question about rain gardens. Um, I live in a flood way, which is kind of like a little worse than a flood zone. Um, and putting rain gardens and infrastructure like this in an area that floods very heavily, how does that affect the maintenance? How does that affect what plants, you know, we don't need to get super specific, but is there a different tack that's taken in areas that are prone to flooding? Yeah, so, so let me just answer Kathy's question first about the silt. You're so, not at your once, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. So, so depending on the size of the construction, like if it's you at your house adding an addition to your house versus a development going in or something like that, there are laws in place that require erosion control. And this is handled by the local soil conservation district in terms of enforcement. So an erosion control plan needs to be submitted to, to the entity in this area. We have the Hudson Essex Passaic Soil Conservation District. And so depending on the size of the development or the, the construction, there are different controls that need to be in place to manage that silt and to prevent erosion and to make sure that we're we're being environmentally sustainable and making sure that that we're keeping solids and sediment and silt out of our out of our roadways out of our waterways so that entity the the conservation the soil conservation district is the one that handles the erosion plan they do enforcement, they go to sites and look at the installations to make sure that they are up to standards. And so all of those things are in place, but obviously there are many instances where the plan was not applied for or they're not following, they're not following the, the guidelines or you know, they don't do any erosion control. And so that's also part of the Soil Conservation District's mission is to have a stop work order issued when people aren't doing their sediment control properly. And um, they, they get a lot of bad press because they are doing their jobs of trying to protect the environment and protect our resources and even protect our soil, which needs to be, you know, our soil. Without soil, we're, we're nothing, we have nothing. Um, and unfortunately, there are even municipal and government officials that are not following the, the erosion control plans. And so stop work orders are issued and there is a lot of pushback and there are, there are all kinds of stories about that. But in general, the Soil Conservation District does a great job of managing those construction projects and making sure that that silt and soil is not getting into the roadway, not getting into, into the storm system and down into our rivers and, and streams. But, but there, are, there are plenty of exceptions and there are bad apples that, that try to go around um, those, those laws. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's not great. We're not at hundred percent compliance for sure. Um, but, but they do an amazing job. So if you have questions or if you want to report a construction site in, 
in Passaic County, uh, I can give you the info for, for the Soil Conservation District because that's it's definitely a problem and they're always, they appreciate uh, residents reaching out to them so that they know where the problems are. Yeah, once, um, I learned, once I learned in the Master Gardener class that it takes 500 years to make an inch of topsoil, I looked at dirt in a whole nother way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really, I, I mean. Yeah, we have some more questions. Um, it, you can skip my question if you want to, um, so okay. we can answer other people's questions, so I'm sorry. Um, we, we had one question from Renee asking about porous pavement, how it holds up to salt and snow melt. Um, I just yeah. did want to mention that it is softer. It's often more used, if correct me if I'm wrong, for parking spots rather than the driveway area because um, it is softer than regular tra traditional asphalt. But I don't know how it holds up to salt. I hope you can answer that. And then we had another question about, um, well, things that I, I, I can understand, Lucy, your question about what to put and not put on the yard in the spring. Uh, New Jersey actually has very uh, strict fertilizer laws. You should always follow the instructions on your fertilizer or whatever you're using on your lawn. Um, I hope you don't mind me answering this, Amy. Yeah, no, you're doing great. Thanks. <laughs> Household remedies are, are often um, discouraged only because they're not scientifically tested or proven. So we want to make sure that we follow. You should do a soil test. I just did one. Um, do a soil test with Rutgers um, and find out what your lawn actually needs because otherwise you're just shooting in the dark. Um, I also live on a right on a waterway. The river is right there behind me. So I'm very conservative about what I put on my yard. Um, but I did just do a soil test so I could find out specifically what it needs and put as little down as possible. Um, so I, I hope that it's okay. I answered that. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, the salt and snow with the permeable pavement. That's a very good question. Yeah, so so these types of materials actually do hold up well uh, with winter, and they they actually reduce the uh, occurrence of black ice because when the snow starts to melt, instead of just laying on the surface and refreezing at night, the water is actually going down through um, through that that first permeable layer and getting down into the storage. And so these systems actually require less salt. They don't have the, the frost heave um, that traditional um, surfaces have. And so, so they actually perform better in the winter. It's just that sometimes people are, are scared of them, um, but for sure the, the pervious concrete has to have a specific type of salt put down rather than the, the traditional um, sodium or magnesium because the, the salt will eat into the pervious concrete at a higher rate than the, the traditional concrete. But for, for asphalt, traditional regular salt is fine. Um, you can use a snow plow, it's not a problem. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of research on this and actually the, um, the University of New Hampshire has a huge permeable pavement research center and they've been doing winter uh, research on permeable pavement specifically because people have those, those questions. So if you need me to send reports or anything like that, if, if you are the Renee that I already reached out to today, then I have your email. So I will I will connect you with the, the UNH Stormwater Center because they have all kinds of info on winter um, conditions and permeable pavement. So I'll send you that. Oh, and Renee, if it's the same Renee that sent in the tree question, um, I put my email, which is um, McEwenK at waynetownship.com. I can tell you exactly the precise um, process that Wayne Township has dealing with trees and answer any questions or give any advice. Um, I know they do that the Parks and Recreation who handles that does rely heavily on input from citizens. So if you see someone who is cutting down trees um, in town, they, they're supposed to be permitted. Um, so if you have a, an inkling that maybe that's not happening, then I, I encourage you to report that to Parks and Recreation. Um, 
Lucy says, oh, she like <laughs> less grass, more dirt in gardens. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um, I Lucy, if you need help or a guidance doing a soil test, I highly recommend that. So um, feel free to reach out. Um, if if anybody, to, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Amy, you've been so informative and patient with us. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. I'm glad people had questions. I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm here for you. It's it's great to meet you, Katie. And um, you know, I'm here. If the town has questions or if you have have things we need to talk about, just let me know. And yeah, it's, uh, I'm hoping it's to really one but one day stop by the office and get more soil tests. And you know, when I get my voice back and my health back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't come when you're sick. <laughs> no, I would never. I would never. Yeah, yeah. We, our office is open to the public, and we are selling soil test kits. If if anyone wants them, we're right on 23 behind Ski Barn. Um, and Gary's wine. So come visit. We'll, uh, we'll check out our new digs. We have a brand new office that your tax dollars paid for. So come visit. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get a soil test for my aunt. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Come like, on oh, you know how to do this stuff now? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's great. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Anybody else questions? Oh, we have a new message. Hold on. Soil um, tests are $20. The basic soil yeah. test is $20, right? Yep. That, that tests for macronutrients. Um, if you want like a dissertation on that, I can give you all my notes from my master gardener class. It yeah. tests for micronutrients, not for nitrogen is too volatile in the, in the natural environment. So they don't test for nitrogen, but what, what else? What am I else? Oh, um, soil structure. Yeah, so the the basic test is pH, um, cation exchange capacity, and uh, they can also give recommendations for what kinds of plants or vegetables will do well in your soil. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, if you need more information, actually the soil structure test is different than the than the okay. basic one. So, um, but the Rucker Soil Testing Lab has a whole variety of of tests. So um, actually I can put that website in the chat. Um, the, yeah, the um, form is available online. You can see all the different permutations of soil tests that are available. Yeah. So put that in the chat. You can also, if you have a service, if you don't do a lot in your own yard and you have a service or you have somebody, and I think most people are on here are somewhat involved with their property on that level. But if you do have somebody doing it for you, you can ask them to, to do the soil test for you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, you can contact the office and, and find a master gardener. Um, we're all volunteers and we're all very willing to help. Um, but you can have somebody do it for you and measure your nutrients and find out what is the best. They can tailor fertilizer to what your lawn needs rather than just dumping a bunch of chemicals. You know, if you go to the store and buy a bunch of fertilizer, and to just dump it on your lawn, you're really kind of wasting money. Yeah, please follow the instructions. <laughs> yeah. And no, no fertilizer in New Jersey after November 15th. There's a there's a embargo after November 15th before March 1st. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so we're back. We're we're back in the the green light period for, for fertilizer, yeah. but please have your soil tested before you apply any fertilizer. Um, a lot of people over fertilize and do things that are unnecessary and harmful to the environment. So definitely have a soil test before you, before you apply anything to your property. Anybody else have, thank you for the website, Amy. Anybody else have yeah. questions? You can always email if you don't feel comfortable posting them publicly, feel free to email me. Or if it's something Amy can answer, feel free to email Amy. Yeah. Feel free to kick any emails back to me, Amy, if it's something Wayne specific. Sure, sure. Um, thanks so much to, um, to Amy Rowe and to Patty Slezak and the public Wayne Public Library. These public education programs I think are really wonderful. And this is a very big problem in our town. So I hope that some people can come back and watch this after the library makes it available um, on their website um, for viewing offline. Um, and um, I hope that it, it causes some wheels to turn and some questions to be generated later on. So we're here if you need us.
I just wanted to thank Amy and Katie for taking the time to educate us about green infrastructure and letting us learn about the importance and the impact it has on our environment and also our community. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much for having me.